Well, welcome to uh, Renewal Cast today. Uh, we are we're live, and uh, we're joined by uh, uh, a special guest with us today, Dr. JV Pesco. Just thank you, want to thank you so much for for being with us, and we're gonna uh, we're gonna get uh, we're gonna learn a little bit about uh, the covenant of works today. So uh, that might be a, a subject that, that some of our listeners. Uh, think is uh, something that is irrelevant uh, to us. Maybe there's a misunderstanding about what uh, that covenant is. Uh, We want to kind of just tackle that, help us understand that, and maybe talk a little bit about the the history uh, of that going forward. So uh, with that, um, Dr. Fesco, why don't you just take a, a moment, will you tell us a little bit about yourself and about your your ministry and, and your family and kind of give our, our listeners a um, little introduction into yourself. Yeah, no, I've, uh, I have the, the blessing of saying that I was a, um, uh, I was uh, born into a, a household with two, uh, two parents that are Christians. And so uh, there's a sense in which I feel like I've never known a day apart from Christ. And so I, that's, that to me is, a, it's a huge blessing. It, the more and more I think about it, 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 I used to think that it was a boring, you know, story, but, the more and more I run into people, I realize that in a sense, kind of how unique it is. And so I'm very grateful for that. My parents uh, always took me to where there were churches where there was really strong preaching. That was one of the big things that they looked for. But long story short, when I was in my post-college years, uh, there was a pastor at our church who kept on talking and quoting about this guy named R.C. Sproul. And uh, so when I was getting ready to go off to seminary, um, some, you know, that, that, that my, my folks bought me a number of his books. And so I started reading. And then before I knew it, I was, uh, listening to tons of his tapes, uh, and in listening to his tapes, um, I was listening to not only the popular stuff, but also the, the obscure stuff that he produced, like the history of philosophy, the history of theology, you know, and these really kind of seminary level, uh, courses that he had recorded. And so I would, you know, call home, need more money, send more tapes, uh, you know, and basically, I just, you know, trying to soak in as much as I could while I was in seminary and uh, ended up going to uh, get my Ph.D. Uh, at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland after I graduated from seminary and then was a church planter with the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. And that eventually transitioned to me being a pastor. Uh, and so I was a pastor and church planner for about 11 years. And then after that, I went to Westminster Seminary, California, where I served there as an academic dean and a professor of systematic and historical theology for 10 years. And now for the last, oh, I don't know, 18 months or so, I've been here in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, serving at uh, Reformed Theological Seminary and just really loving life here. Uh, it's been it's just been a fantastic transition for us. We um, I've got uh, my wife. Uh, we've been married for 18 years and um my three kids, a little girl who's seven, and my two boys that are 10 and 13. And uh, if you're standing still too long around them, they may shoot you with one of their airsoft rifles. Uh, but uh, but yeah, so yeah, just a great family, great, uh, great institution that I work for. I, I, I pinch myself sometimes because I think I can't believe that I, I get to do all of this and have this much fun and get paid too. So, you know, hey. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's great. Actually, last night I have a uh, some boys that are uh, seven and and five, and we were watching Dude Perfect uh, oh, yeah. last night. And yeah. there's one where they have airsoft rifles, and they're uh, having a contest. And both of them are like, look at me and said, "When can we get one of those?" <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's a lot of fun, and they like inflicting pain. So I just yeah. um, stay away. Yeah. Um, well, let's let's get uh, right into this. Uh, what is the what is the covenant of works? I mean, kind of a just a throw it out there. Yeah, no, I think you know we could start with the the the, the first part of that. What is a covenant? And I okay. go with children's catechism which just gives a very basic definition that says a covenant is an agreement between two or more people and it's like i tell my students that uh, the nature of the agreement can take on all sorts of shapes and forms depending upon who the parties of the covenant are 
You know, so if it's two equal parties, it can look one way. If it's a superior party and an inferior party, it can look another way. If it's God and 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 His people, it can take on another another way, uh, and it can look in a different take on different characteristics. Uh, so if we add to that, then the latter half of the question, what is the covenant of works? We could say that it's the agreement that the, that uh, God makes with uh, Adam when he is first created, uh, that if he is uh, perfectly obedient uh, to uh, the commands of God, that he will reward him with uh, eternal life. Uh, and um, that's just a very fundamental, uh, you know, description and, and, and uh, statement of it. You know, the Westminster Confession of Faith states it slightly differently. It says in Westminster Confession, Chapter 7, Paragraph 2, which is very similar, I think, to the, uh, you know, at least the, the substantive teaching of the Second London Confession, 1689, that the first covenant made with man was a covenant of works, wherein life was promised to Adam and to him, to his posterity upon condition of perfect and, and personal obedience. So that just, you know, that, that's just a very fundamental uh, basic definition as to what it is. Uh, and then from there, depending upon the theologian that you're reading, there there might be different accents or different emphases uh, that they'll that they'll focus upon. Yeah, <laughs> Dr. Fesco, I uh, am teaching a Sunday school class on the covenants, and and I taught covenant of works several weeks back, and I and I was looking at the historical uh, uh, view of the covenant of works, and and I kind of googled historical view of the covenant of works, and your name came up actually and and it talked about you it had a little bit of a segment on even in the intertestamental period is mm-hmm. that true that that there was the jews even held that there was a, a an aspect that they held to a covenant of works is that true yeah you know i want to distinguish here a little bit to say that the idea of an adamic covenant and notice i've dropped off the phrase works just for the sake of discussion but the idea of an adamic covenant goes way back. Uh, so like you said, you know, if you read the wisdom of Ben Sirach, which is uh, otherwise known as Sirach, uh, and I think it's chapter 14, verse 17, it's uninspired, so it's not a canonical scripture, uh, and uh, it is uh, intertestamental literature that unfolds between, you know, prophet Malachi and uh, the gospel of Matthew. So in that that 400-year uh, drought of revelation that, that the people of God uh, experience, that they, it says there that, you know, it, it quotes Genesis 2, 16 and 17, that in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And it says that that was the administration of the covenant. Um, and in fact, it's in reading Ben Sirach that Augustine reads Ben Sirach and then um uh, picks it up and 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 g- talks about an Adamic covenant in um, in his city of God uh, when he's talking about the Adamic context and you know people might immediately say well what good is Ben Sirach it's uninspired you know it's not it's not canonical scripture so why should we listen to it and we should say okay yeah it's uninspired but on the other hand we can say that it's one of the uh, earliest extra biblical commentaries on the Old Testament, in particular on the creation account. And so if you have Jews who are reading the Old Testament and they're saying, hey, there's a covenant here, uh, that's that's significant. And so it says that it's not just some, you know, harebrained scheme that uh, 16th century or 17th century, uh, you know, reformers invented, but that rather it's something that has pedigree that goes back before the days of Christ. Uh, that's I think that's significant, um, and uh, so that's at least one of the, the the historical anchor points that we can say for people seeing a covenant between God and Adam in the Genesis creation account. Yeah, I would say as somebody who was uh, kind of born again into a dispensational church, I'd say that's huge that 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 those things come way back historically. Yeah. That, that are ecumenical, you know, this yeah. covenant of works is more ecumenical than reformed. I'd yeah. say that's huge. No, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Uh, I, I really appreciate how you, you went back and, and just said, okay, let's, let's talk about what a, a covenant is because that that's so important in this discussion because actually, right. If I correct me, if I'm wrong, but the, the word covenant doesn't appear until, like the sixth chapter of 
of Genesis, right? So, you know, a lot of people point out, um, and I even I even found some quotes from like a, you know, a, a master seminary journal uh, from from 2007 where they're they're talking about how, um, you know, that th- this is just an unbiblical idea of a, of a covenant of, of works. There's there's no covenant here because that the word isn't there. I guess how would you answer that objection? Yeah. I think that, you know, one of the things that we have to do is we have to get out of the mindset that in order for a doctrine or an idea to be present, that the term has to appear in the passage. You know, on the one hand, if a term appears in a passage, okay, like say the term justification, okay, then there's, you know, a high, high, high probability that 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 particular passage is going to be talking about the doctrine of justification, but on the other hand, we also have to recognize the nature of communication. And, and uh, you know, if just earlier before we got on the call, um, you know, John, I noted that John was wearing, uh, you know, Nebraska, uh, you know, a pullover. And I even made made reference to the, the idea, of, you know, big red. And so let's pretend that that's something that just goes unsaid. Uh, and then somebody goes and listens, say, to the transcript of this in a, in a hundred years, and they say, you know, well, mention was nobody ever mentioned it. Well, that's right, nobody ever mentioned it, but we 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 just have an assumption here that we see him, he's wearing it, and so we can have that shared understanding. Well, similar token, and you know, by similar token, when we're looking at the Old Testament or say the creation account, you know, let's pretend that we're talking about a wedding. Uh, and as we're reading the passage, we hear and we, we see things like invitation. We see things like um, uh, groomsman, bridesmaid, minister, caterer. Uh, the natural conclusion that we're going to draw when we see all of these words is, oh, they're talking about a wedding, even if the word wedding never appears uh, in the passage. Well, along those similar lines, we want to say that do we see other, you know, signal f- flags that would indicate that there's there's a covenant here, that we see covenantal elements. And in particular, one of the things you find in the historical reading of, of, of Genesis, uh, and you see this, say, with that Sirach 14, 17 uh, passage, is that they see in Genesis 2, 16 and 17 that when God threatens death uh, upon disobedience of his command, they're saying, hey, that looks a lot like the administration of the Mosaic Covenant, where God administers his covenant and his law, and he threatens death upon the uh, the transgression of that, of that covenant. And in fact, you see the same types of verbal patterns, thou shalt not, at least as it would read in the King James English. It's the same types of Hebrew passages uh, or Hebrew language that you find uh, in the administration of that, that prohibition uh, in the Garden of Eden. You see concomitant blessings. When God administers the dominion mandate in Genesis one twenty six and following, when he says, you know, be fruitful, multiply, fill all the earth and subdue it, it's specifically categorized as a blessing. And so all of a sudden, you look at Deuteronomy 28, when God lays out the blessings and the curses, life for, for obedience and blessing, curse for disobedience, uh, as well as death. Those are the same types of things that you see unpacked in, uh, in Genesis uh, you know, other factors is that in, uh, you know, in the broader Pentateuch, say in Exodus 3.14 or other passages, you see the covenant name of God, Yahweh. Once again, you see the covenant name of Yahweh appearing in Genesis 2, uh, you know, uh, 4 and following. And so you begin to stack up all of these things and the natural reading of somebody who would have been familiar, intimately familiar with the Mosaic Covenant, would look at this and say, there are all of these elements of a covenant. God and Adam are in covenant. Um, and, and in particular, as you look at historic exegesis of the opening two chapters or three chapters of Genesis, one of the things that you see, say, in a theologian like Francis Turretin, is that he's, he's reading Genesis 1 through 3 in the broader context of the Pentateuch. And he's reading it against the backdrop of Deuteronomy, and which Deuteronomy is the covenantal charter of the Old Testament people of Israel. And so he's, he's, he's reading these things as mutually informing his reading. He's not taking what we might say is, say, a, a, a popular kind of literalistic <clears throat> approach 
where it says, I'm only looking at the first three chapters of Genesis. I don't think any Old Testament Israelite would have read the first three chapters of Genesis in that, in that fashion. You know, they would have read it along the backdrop of the Pentateuch so that the serpent shows up, they would automatically know. Leviticus identifies the serpent as an unclean animal. What is an unclean animal doing within the confines of the first temple? Because wh- why is the garden a temple? Because it has the presence of God. Because Adam is the first priest. Because Adam has clothing. Uh, or he's given the task of to tend and to keep the garden. Those are two terms that appear tons of times throughout the Old Testament. But the only places that those two terms appear together is in describing the priestly service in the temple. So they see all of these indicators that say this is covenantal activity. Um, you know, so uh, read against the broader context of the, the Pentateuch, and then we would say the rest of the canon of Scripture, the, the, the overwhelming evidence is that they're in covenant. And the fact that you have Sirach 14, 17 making that same conclusion, I think, shows again that it's not just peculiar to reform folks but that you've got intertestamental Jews coming to similar conclusions. Yeah. So yeah. I think sin, that's, <clears throat> oh, I was just going to say sin isn't mentioned in Genesis three, but who would argue right. that sin? <laughs> yeah. sin isn't involved there Probably. along those lines, Adam and Eve are never said really to be uh, married in a, in a covenantal relationship. And yet you see the signs and six, you know, the husband and wife. Okay. Well, it doesn't say that they were married, but okay. They, they, they must be. Uh, So we do it all the time. It's just that for some reason about some doctrines, we get squirrely and we, we, we want to see a specific word instead of asking, is the idea present? And uh, so anyway. Yeah. Yeah. We'll say as six, seven does call it a covenant later on, even if that is debated, but yeah, no, it is. Yeah. And I think that especially, yeah, there are other connections there, but yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. On the ecumenical nature of it, you note that even Arminius affirmed the covenant of works, right? Mm-hmm. And and Schaefer, so it's even dispensationalists can affirm a covenant of works. Some of that may seem, I don't understand how that works. Seems like there might be some inconsistencies there, but. Yeah. <laughs> well, see, that's the thing is that you find, it's like I was reading uh, a, a oh. speech that was delivered at the Council of Trent. Right. And it was delivered at Trent, I think, in 1545, 1546. And so this is 25 to 30 years really before any Reformed theologian is speaking of uh, an explicit covenant of works. And you have Roman Catholics speaking of God's covenant with Adam. Uh, you know, they just kind of just mention it and there's absolutely no, no qualms about it. And in fact, the first explicit reference that you find to a fully federal imputation of Adam's guilt comes from a Roman Catholic theologian, again, 30 years before any Reformed theologian ever says it. So if you've got, you know, intertestamental Jews, Jacob Arminius, Catholics at Trent, uh, and then Reformed theologians, and then even some dispensational theologians, that ought to tell you, hey, uh, maybe this isn't as parochial, parochial as some people may think, and it has a broader Catholic with a small c uh, kind of universal attestation, which should, you know, perk up our ears and our minds to, to, for us to give it greater attention and, and, uh, and, and investigate it. You know, one of the, one of the things that I, I think about uh, or I've read about the, the covenant of works um, and, and just anticipating some of the, the comments I'm going to get after this podcast is, um, you know, here's, here's uh God saying you you must do this thing, but doesn't God want us to to love Him freely? Mm-hmm. Uh, is there you know the the relationship between uh, love and, and obedience here? Can can God uh, command us to to love Him? Yeah, no, I, I you know the, the the quick answer to that question is yes, He can command us to love Him, and and this is where we have to uh, string I think texts of Scripture together that we know but not, might not necessarily uh, draw together on a single strand in order to see them together. But, you know, when Jesus is asked in Matthew twenty two thirty seven, 37, what's the first and greatest commandment? So he's saying commandment, and he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. 
And so, of course, Jesus is, is, is quoting Deuteronomy 6, 4, which is, you know, the, the, the covenantal, again, the covenantal charter of Israel. So that here, when God is in covenant with Israel, he's telling them, I'm commanding you to love me. Now, within the context of the ancient Near Eastern world in which, you know, the, 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 the law of God, you know, comes to us in that, in that historical context. And, of course, it comes to us by divine revelation, so I don't want to in any way uh, weaken that aspect of it. It's a context in which a sovereign, it's, it's, it's not a problem for a sovereign to say, I'm giving you a command that you, you, you can love me. And that, I think, is one of the biggest misnomers about the covenant of works is that uh, so many critics of the covenant of works in print will talk about it as some sort of loveless transaction between God and Adam. And yet I scratch my head because as I've read, you know, tons and tons of treatments of it, um, so many of these theologians will talk about the covenant of works as being the arena of the love of God, both the love that God shows to Adam and to Eve, as well as the arena in which Adam and Eve now have the opportunity to show their love uh, to God, uh, you know, so that, you know, or as Jesus has said in the Gospels, as well as you see this in the Johannine epistles, if you love me, keep my commandments. Uh, you know, so these, you know, in, in the present, submission, obedience are, are cuss words, uh, and, you know, the idea of putting obedience and love in the same sentence is supposedly oxymoronic. But uh, in the Bible, they go hand in hand uh, and they're, they're wedded together most beautifully. Uh, and so that's something I think that the covenant of works captures, as do all of the biblical covenants that really they find love at their core. So much so that that's one of the, the key phrases or the key terms in the Old Testament has said, which is, a, is just a Hebrew term, which sometimes gets translated as faithfulness. Other times it gets translated as covenant love. Uh, and that is this unique expression of love and obedience within the confines of a, of a, of a covenant. So that, that's the way I would you know, respond to that, that particular question. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's good and really helpful, you know, that uh, today, you know, in, in a, a more progressive Christianity, you see this idea of, you know, God's love as being something that is totally unrelated to, to obedience. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think that's where, you know, this comes along and says, well, wait a minute, you know, God's love, uh, you know, for us and our obedience to him are, are, like you said, tied uh, together and the scripture does that. So. Yeah. And I think uh, along those lines, I would just want to add very quickly that the, I think the reason we see a disconnect there is because we disconnect the law from God, and we think of it as some sort of arbitrary command, but if we recognize that the law of God is a mirror or a reflection of the character of God, then as he is calling us to obey, he is calling us as image bearers to, to, to be conformed to his image. And so the way that we are conformed to his image is by being like him, by obeying him, and by doing what he commands, which means that we're living up to, we could say, the full potential of our uh, divine design. And of course, because of sin entering into the picture, where we have diverted from God's will and we have rebelled against it, uh, then we are out of conformity to God. So God in Christ, by his grace, is calling us back into conformity uh, with his will. So in the end, that's how I think love and obedience, you know, go hand in hand, because ultimately it means conformity unto the unto the, the perfect image uh, of God, which, praise God, you know, through the gospel we have through Christ. How does the covenant of works connect to other doctrines? I think that what is so important in recognizing this is there was a Dutch Reformed theologian by the name of Wilhelmus Abrockel who wrote in the Christian's Reasonable Service, which is his four-volume, it, it's kind of like a systematic theology, but uh, in his four-volume doctrinal work, where he says, he who does not understand the covenant of works will undoubtedly make errors in the doctrine of Christ and salvation, especially as it pertains to the doctrine of Christ's active obedience, 
uh, and the and his imputed righteousness and the doctrine of justification. So long story short, if you don't understand the covenant of works, you're going to misunderstand the covenant of grace or the way that uh, the uh, the work of Christ works and how we receive it. In the covenant of works, you know, to borrow the language of the Westminster Confession and, and catechisms, God calls Adam to perfect personal and perpetual obedience. And that's the means by which he is supposed to secure uh, eternal life. Uh, for his those who are he whom he federally represents, but because of the fall, God does not change Adam's work. Uh, the work is the same, but what God does is He sends somebody who will faithfully carry it out, which Paul calls him the last Adam, or the you know we could say the second Adam, and it is Jesus who comes to take up that fallen work of Adam. And so not only does Jesus offer his personal, perfect, and perpetual obedience, but he also suffers uh, the penalty for uh, the broken covenant of works for anybody who is united to him. And so if if you don't get the covenant of works right, you're going to end up making mistakes vis-a-vis the the, the person and work of Christ. But there are other doctrinal connections as well, is that one of the things that the covenant of works does is it gives us the covenantal context for our doctrine of humanity or our anthropology so that, you know, we can say that all people are covenant breakers because we are all in Adam and Adam broke the covenant of works. We all have a knowledge of God's law because part of the covenant of works is God inscribing his law upon our hearts so that we would know the moral and ethical standards to which God holds us uh, because we are image bearers as well. Uh, and then all of us, why is there death in this world? Why is it that from you know the, the most recalcitrant sinner to the most seemingly innocent infant who is, is innocent of, of any active wrongdoing, is nevertheless subject to death. Uh, well, it's because all of us, as Paul says in Romans five twelve and following, have sinned in Adam. Uh, because of the transgression of the one, the many were constituted as sinners. And then conversely, because of the, the one righteous act of the one, many will be constituted as righteous, as Paul says in Romans five nineteen. So there's just so many important you know, connections there. You know, it's like I tell my students this, in order to understand the doctrine of justification correctly, which is at the heart of the gospel, um, you have to understand the covenant of works. You have to go back uh, to the Garden of Eden, because that, in a sense, is where the doctrine of justification first appears. You mentioned, I think, in one of your books that I was looking at, uh, Thomas Boston and John Calhoun, some of the moral men, did they do something in developing the doctrine of the covenant of works? Uh, in a sense, no. And in another sense, yes. So I will straddle both sides of that question, but in different ways. As a good scholastic, or at least somebody who tries to be, I'll distinguish. I'll make a good distinction, hopefully. And that in one sense, what they do is like you read Colhoun or you read Boston. And what they're doing is they're repeating uh, the uh, the streams of thought that flow from the Westminster Assembly, you know, they're they're just articulating that. So in that sense, they're continuing, uh, you know, that that uh, that that strain of of reformed theology. And you could say that equally in the 18th century of other theologians such as John Gill. Um, you know, John Gill, I would say, you know, he's a you know particular Baptist, Reformed Baptist, but um, you know, he gets a bad rap as being an antinomian. Um, I don't think it's that simple. Uh, you might say that he has an antinomian strain in him, but I don't necessarily think that that makes him an outright antinomian. But he, too, picks up on a lot of this confessional reform tradition and, and carries it forward. But uh, what Boston and Colquhoun do in the sense of maybe contribute positively or developing things is that it's in the 18th century where you begin to see the doctrine uh, starting to get criticized. And so they are essentially pushing against the tide of the deconfessionalization of the tradition and the, um, 
uh, and the, uh, the, the I guess the anti covenant of works uh, uh, drum beats that are starting to sound. And so, in the face of that kind of opposition, they're saying, "No, this is sound doctrine, and we need to continue to uphold it." Boston, more so, I think, towards the uh, the, the the latter third of the eighteenth century, uh, and then Colquhoun more so the, the last portions of the 18th and then in the early uh, 19th century. Uh, but in that sense, th- so that's the sense in which they're not doing anything new, but on the other hand, they are kind of doing something unique in the sense of holding the line when the line was starting to, 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 to waver. Sure. How do we continue to recover it today? And how does, does recovering and covenant of works help solve any of the problems in evangelicalism today? Mm. You know, I think that the, the, one of the things that I continually do with my students is um, I always encourage them to read primary sources. So like I teach, you know, two different church history courses. Uh, I teach a course on the Westminster standards and like for my church history courses, I don't assign a church serve a church history survey. I simply give one as recommended reading, you know, so that I say, if you want a survey, you know, you can look at this, this, this survey text and you can read what it has to say about the periods that we're covering. So I'm not trying to diminish the importance of surveys. They, they have their place and value. But if I have a limited number of pages that I can assign, uh, then I'm always assigning primary sources. So we covered Luther this, this week. And so I gave them three treatises by Luther to read. You know, we're reading, we're doing Calvin next week. And so I'm going to give them on the necessity of reforming the church. When we talk about pietism, I'm having them read Philip Jacob Spencer. You know, when we're talking about uh, 19th century liberalism, I'm having them read um, Charles Finney, you know, straight, you know. So rather than read the books that talk about the book, want them reading those books. Well, in that vein, uh, my, 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 my advice would be is anytime you're reading about the covenant of works and especially criticisms about it, note the criticisms and then go and read broadly, uh, read primary source texts, read what Turretin has to say, read what a Brockle, read what Boston, what Colquhoun, you know, read what advocates of the doctrine have to say and to see, first of all, how and where do they exegete the scriptures to, to, to support the covenant of works? By the 19th century, the covenant of works is, is criticized as a one trick pony. It's only and maybe Hosea 6, 7 that might be exegetical support. But when you study the history of it, you find that Hosea 6, 7 is an early text in the discussion in, say, the fourth century when Jerome is translating the Vulgate. But and it, it appears at spots in the Middle Ages, say in Aquinas uh, or in some some other medieval theologians. But then it drops out, and it doesn't really appear in the discussion until the late 17th century among Dutch Reformed theologians. So for a good hundred years, they're arguing for the covenant of works. They're not even looking at Hosea six seven, um, or the, very little. Um, you know so. And then when you survey the number of different texts from which they're arguing, it's more than a dozen different passages of scripture that they're arguing for this doctrine. In in a book that I've got, God willing, coming out next fall, um, I've got eight chapters on different passages of scripture that I argue to support the covenant of works, not just uh, Hosea 6-7. And I think that the case is quite strong for it exegetically. So that's going forward. When you read old books, you can see that most of the criticisms are are unwarranted. You can also see where they're exegeting the scriptures and how they're coming to their conclusions. And then that hopefully drives us back to the scriptures so that we can get in the present day a thicker reading uh, of the creation account. And so that we can hopefully also recover what I would call a rich a whole canon understanding of doctrine. Uh, Because unlike in the contemporary period where we want to look at, you know, little texts just here and there in these isolated sections, you see these older theologians going to the whole Bible and just 
pulling a, a thread all the way throughout from Genesis to Revelation. And so uh, I think in doing that, understanding the covenant of works in a, in a stronger way, I think will help us understand the covenant of grace and especially the doctrine of justification, which, as I said, lies at the heart of the gospel. I, I think that that's what is the problem in the broader evangelical church is we have an anemic doctrine of justification because we, we don't coordinate it with the covenant of works. Uh, we don't look at, we don't, we don't understand the work of the last Adam because we haven't taken sufficient amount of time to study the work of the first. Dr. Fesco, if you were, uh, had to go to an Island, banished to an Island, and had to take your Bible, what, and could take two other books with you, what would you take? I would cheat and I would take three, uh, okay. which would be uh, Francis, Francis Turretin's three volumes. Um, okay. I just, I love, I mean, don't get me wrong. Calvin's Institutes are good. I just love Turretin's Institutes. Yeah. Um, I if, I, if I could double cheat, I would take Turretin and, um, and Bavink. Uh, okay. Even though that's seven books, technically that's only two authors. So maybe I could squeak by with that. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll let you do that. How about a broccoli? <laughs> you like it? You like uh, uh, a, broccoli? a broccoli? Yeah, a broccoli is great. A broccoli has the precision of Turretin, but the pastoral warmth uh, and devotional, I think, uh, the devotional. Um, uh, I guess light uh, of a of a pastor's heart. Don't get me wrong, Turretin is is a pastor too, uh, but yeah. Turretin is much more interested in. It's very precise. And I tell okay. my students, Turretin is best consumed in small doses. You know, you read two, three, four questions, and you really have to think hard. Uh, it's very rewarding, but it's like it's like eating peanut butter on white bread with no milk. You know, it gets stuck to the roof of your mouth, so you gotta you gotta swallow slowly. Whereas, um, you know, um, uh, a broccoli goes down really smooth uh, and and easily, but he still has the same degree of precision. So a broccoli is fantastic. In fact, he's sitting up here on my shelf, way up here that you can't see. So he's right over my head, looking down on me. Yeah, I just got him. I I'm, I started to, started to get into him. I really like him. Yeah, I mean, if you're ever if you're ever doing some sort of doctrinal anything and you want to think through the practical aspects of a doctrine, crack open a broccoli uh, and he will definitely serve you exceptionally well in that regard. Yeah. Well, thanks. That's, that's good. Sure. Yeah. And we'll, we'll try to put links to some of these resources in the, <laughs> in the show notes later on. Yeah. Uh, just in case anybody's, going off to a, a desert island with a couple books to, to bring. Yeah. Dr. Well, Pesco's book on the Covenant of Works is on sale for $82, I saw. Woohoo! Break out the, <laughs> break out the piggy bank. I didn't realize it was that cheap. <laughs> well, you're, one coming out next fall, that's the, the, uh, the, la- the, the cheap man's version? Is that, is that? Yes. Well, yes and no. In that, um, that one, God willing, will retail. I see. I've got I've got two concurrent series that I'm trying to work on, and it's on the covenants. And so, one half of the series is the history of the of the covenants. So I've done the covenant history of the covenant of redemption, and now the history of the covenant of works. Those are the two out. One by Van and Hook and Ruprecht, and the other by Oxford Press. And God willing, I'll do a third <clears throat> relation on the history of the covenant of grace. Well, I've got the doctrine not the history, but the doctrine of the covenant of redemption. And that's published with mentor or Christian focus. And that one is, uh, I don't know, 25 bucks or so, something like that. And that's the one where I've got the second one. And it's it, the second one is titled, um, I think it's Adam and the covenant of works. And uh, so that one's coming out. And while this one covers some of the same ground as the history one, um, I cover I, I include information that is not included in the history one. The history one is a chronological survey of the development of the doctrine, whereas in the history part of the second volume that I do, I have, it's a topical approach to unique topics. So I talk about the question of Adam's faith, uh, the question of the historical interpretation of Leviticus 18.5, um, 
the, um, uh, the, the different terms that the theologians used for the covenant of works. Um, and so there are, I think, five or six chapters that talk about historical questions uh, surrounding the covenant of works. And then there are eight chapters, eight exegetical chapters, and then a five doctrinal chapters, you know, where it's a statement of the doctrine, the covenant of works and justification, covenant of works and, uh, you know, the question of pre-fall grace um, and, and, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, that one is uh, that one's supposed to be or God willing will be about 25 bucks, you know, give or take. OK, well, we'll definitely definitely be looking forward to that that when it comes out. Uh, if there's somebody listening to this that just is is really wanting to uh to, to study the the covenant of, of works now and just kind of a an easy introductory uh would you have a, a recommendation of, of where we can start yeah you know there are two two uh ones that i would recommend uh hopefully we're not under desert island uh constrictions here uh but <laughs> um the first is sacred bond and sacred bond is written by zach keel and mike brown i think it's in a second edition and i think it's published by reform fellowship it's a very, very accessible and brief introduction to covenant theology. If you're looking for something with a little bit more heft, uh, the faculty of RTS just published uh, about a month or two ago with Crossway, uh, a book entitled Covenant Theology. And it's a full uh, exegetical, theological, and historical survey. The chapters are... Um, I don't know. They're about maybe 15 pages to 20 pages each. So they're not, you know, really, uh, you know, really long winded uh, chapters like one or two of my chapters, maybe in one or two of my books. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's a fantastic book. And in fact, uh, our faculty at RTS Jackson, we're reading through the book together as a faculty, uh, you know, uh, two chapters at a go and then having discussions about it. And so that that, too, I think is a, is a fantastic and excellent resource. Great. Well, thank you. Well, you guys, John, Jay, you guys have any more, any, anything else? Well, we want to, we want to thank you, uh, Dr. Fesco for your, your time uh, just to spend with us and, and help us uh, think through uh, the, the covenant of works. And just want you to know that we appreciate, uh, appreciate your work and, and what you're doing. And, and we've, we've all come to, to learn and appreciate uh, uh you and and your insight into into some of these things and and just developing our own uh in our own ministries uh you've you've helped us a lot so appreciate that well fantastic praise god thanks so much uh for having me on the uh on the podcast or is this maybe a video well uh, yeah this is the video part and the podcast will come later i don't know how it works (laughs) I'll, i'll take whatever i can get (laughs) <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's a sense in which that's why I do. I write what I write just because I'm hoping that uh, people out there will find it useful and helpful uh, so that uh, they too can kind of dig into those primary sources and uh, and just and have fun and not only have fun, but uh, learn, but ultimately not just learn, but um, but end up, you know, worshiping God because of the amazing things that he's done both in the creation, but especially what he's done for us in Christ and our redemption. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. Fantastic. Thanks a lot. You guys take care. Yeah. Thank you.